Good afternoon. My name is Dan Cotter, and I'm honored to welcome you as president of the Chicago Bar Association. It is a privilege to be hosting this with my good friend and the Chicago Bar Foundation president, Jesse Ruiz. This award luncheon is named after our dear friend, one of Chicago's greatest lawyers, and one of the top Supreme Court justices in modern times, Justice John Paul Stevens. We have a lot of distinguished guests and, and dignitaries here today, and so rather than naming them and missing people, we will just uh, acknowledge all of the federal and state court judges, the elected officials and past presidents and young lawyer section chairs, and uh, members of other bar associations, and welcome to this event. And today we're honored to introduce the distinguished awardees and guests at the dais. To my left, uh, starting at the far left, is Bob Glaves, the CBF Executive Director. Uh, Stephen Elrod, who's the CBA Treasurer this year. We have Carrie Peck, who's one of the awardees. <laughs> Seated next to him is Kimball Anderson, another of our awardees. Seated next to him is Justice Joy Cunningham, another recipient. And seated next to her is Kevin Ford, another one of our recipients. And next to Kevin is Judge William Bauer, Seventh Circuit. And to my immediate left is the guest of honor, Honorable John Paul Stevens, retired. And then to my immediate right is Jesse Ruiz, who you will hear from in a minute. Seated next to him is Pat Holmes, who is our first vice president. Next to her is Justice Kilbride, a recipient. Next to Justice Kilbride is Judge Timothy C. Evans, Chief Judge of the Circuit Court. Next to him is Justice Michael Hyman, another recipient. Seated next to Justice Hyman is Gordon Nash, another recipient. And seated next to Gordon is Gene Camp, another recipient. To her right is Dan Coton, our second vice president. And to the far right is a man who needs no introduction, but will make one anyway, CBA Executive Director Terry Murphy. At this time, I'd like to introduce uh, my good friend Jesse Ruiz to tell you a little bit about a his the history of this luncheon and the award. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dan. And for those who know about Dan's extracurricular activities, you'll know that it's true when I say one of the strongest bar presidents uh, in the country. On behalf of the Chicago Bar Foundation, I would like to welcome you all to today's luncheon to celebrate Justice John Paul Stevens' long and distinguished career and this year's outstanding Stevens Award honorees. <clears throat> Stevens Award was conceived by Justice Stevens' former law clerks, the CBA and the CBF, as a tribute to the justice by honoring those attorneys who best exemplify his commitment to integrity and public service in the practice of law. We thank Justice Stevens for graciously lending his name <clears throat> excuse me, and support to the CBA and the CBF to award this prestigious honor each year, which has become one of the most coveted and treasured recognitions bestowed to a member of Chicago's legal community. First presented in the year 2000, those who have received this prestigious award are really the Hall of Fame of Chicago's legal community. 
As you'll soon see, this year's honorees are very worthy additions to this esteemed group of individuals. As the CBA's charitable arm, the CBF is committed to carrying on Justice Stevens' commitment to the noblest traditions of our profession by working to ensure that everyone in our community has equal access to justice, particularly the low-income and disadvantaged people in our community who are in most critical need of the protections afforded by our legal system. Justice Stevens' pro bono and public service in his career, both as a practicing lawyer and as a judge, is a great inspiration to all of us in the legal community to step up our leadership in the fight to fulfill our nation's fundamental principle of equal access to justice for all. I know that most of you are here are already strong supporters of the work of the Chicago Bar Foundation, and thank you for all that you do to make our work possible. For those of you who have not gotten involved yet, I hope you'll join me and your many other esteemed colleagues in taking a leadership role in this cause that is so critical to all of us. Thank you all for your support of the CBA and the CBF, and thank you, Justice Stevens, for joining us today, and congratulations to all of our honorees. Thank you. We are so proud of Justice Stevens and his extraordinary career in the law and the judiciary, and of his thoughtful proposals in his new book, Six Amendments, How and Why We Should Change the Constitution. In this remarkable man's honor, we recognize today eight attorneys who have, like Justice John Paul Stevens, demonstrated extraordinary integrity and service to the community throughout their careers. With that, we will begin the award ceremony, and the first recipient is Kimball Anderson. Thank you very, very much. Mr. Murphy has generously afforded me an entire 60 seconds to speak to you today, so I choose to speak rapidly about the reasons why my wife Karen and I established the public interest fellowships that are mentioned in the materials. We did so out of a concern over rising law school debt and a lack of access to justice. My wife Karen, by the way, is a very distinguished lawyer in her own right, and she is equally responsible for our philanthropy in this area. We've now had over a decade of experience with these public interest fellowships, and we frequently see applicants, public interest lawyers, with over $250,000 in school debt. We also saw from the Chicago Bar Foundation Legal Needs Study uh, a lack of access to justice. Um, we have the world's finest judicial system in the United States, but unfortunately it's inaccessible to all but the most well-heeled individuals and corporations. Many folks who need to go to court need a public interest lawyer, and there are only about 375 full-time public interest lawyers in Illinois, and these are often the young lawyers who are most burdened with law school debt. So my wife Karen and I have tried to do something to provide financial assistance so that they can stay in their chosen field, and we hope that others will be inspired to follow in our footsteps. And speaking of inspiration, thank you, Justice John Paul Stevens, for lending your name to this award and for being such an inspiration to all of us. Join me in presenting Kimball Anderson. Our next recipient is Justice Joy Cunningham. Speechless, that's what I was. There are very few times in my life when I'm rendered completely speechless. And when Terry Murphy called to tell me that I was to be the recipient of one of this year's John Paul Stevens Awards, I was completely speechless. As it happens, Justice Stevens is one of my all-time favorite Supreme Court justices and I had the honor of interviewing him about 10 years ago in a program for the Bar Association. Besides, he is going to be present this year at the award ceremony, so in my mind, if I could accomplish even a fraction of what this great man has accomplished in his career, then I will feel truly 
honored and humbled and worthy of this award. Justice Stevens really has cut a great path for lawyers to follow. Chicago, in many respects, is at the top of the legal community where it's re respected across the country. So to be selected by my peers in this community to receive this award, it doesn't get much better than this. So what else is there to say except thank you to the committee that selected me along with the stellar nominees who are receiving the award this year. Thank you to the Bar Association, and thank you to my family and friends who have come to share this day with me. Congratulations, Joy. Our next honoree is Kevin Ford. Mr. Justice Stevens, Justice Kilbride, my fellow awardees uh, and friends and lawyers uh, assembled here. Uh, I am uh, very honored to receive this award uh, because in particular uh, the, name, uh, the name it bears, Justice John Paul Stevens, the most respected lawyer and judge of our time. I am also very happy to share this day with my fellow awardees, uh, most of whom I've had the uh, pleasure and honor of working with over the years. Uh, I hope in the years ahead uh, that uh, I can uh, justify uh, the, this, uh, this distinction and honor you've bestowed upon me today. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Kevin. Our next honoree is Justice Michael Hyman. I'm honored to be included with an extraordinary group of individuals, and to each of you, congratulations. I am also awed by the justice for whom this award is named, particularly the artistry of his prose and uh, his analysis, which I, as an appellate court justice, consider the gold standard. Some years ago, I read the remarks of a law professor on the occasion of his retirement. He said that the life of the law is precedence, but the life of a lawyer should be something more. To search within ourselves uh, for answers that precedent does not provide. To go beyond the question, what does the case hold and why, and ask, what is good, what is just, and what is kind? We must do more than just ask the questions. We must act. We must do, we must perform pro bono. We must help those who are needy and vulnerable and marginalized. We must commit ourselves to our communities, involve ourselves in the profession, and participate in the world around us. And if we, lawyers and judges alike, do that, then we truly can embrace what is good, achieve what is just, and in part, what is kind. Congratulations, Michael. Our next honoree is Justice Tom Kilbride. Good afternoon. I'm most grateful to the Chicago Bar Association and especially the anonymous nominators who submitted my name for this award. And I also want to thank the members of the committee who selected me. This comes as a complete surprise. I had no idea it was even underway. But uh, this award for me, from an individual perspective, is uh, there's an unintended consequence. And here's why. During my 14 years on the Illinois Supreme Court, uh, of the opinions I've authored in the majority 
I've only been reversed once by the U.S. Supreme Court in a six to two uh, opinion with one abstention. Unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, depending on your point of view, it was authored by Justice John Paul Stevens. So I take this as an act of redemption. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Justice Kilbride. Well, you all laughed too much. The, fu the punchline at the end was, I take this as an act of redemption. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, maybe I did. That was great. And my apologies, I had listed it out of alphabetical order. Our next recipient is Gene Camp. Of the many wonderful things about receiving this honor, perhaps the most important for me was the nomination itself, which was prepared by two young lawyers in my office, Laura Feldman and Brandy Davis. They prepared it by talking to a lot of my present and former colleagues um, without any notice to me at all. And in it, they praised my mentoring of young women lawyers, which was certainly what gave me the most pride, I have to say. My own first role model was my mother, who went to law school as the only woman in her class when I was in high school. Later, I worked with Olga Jerko, who was a senior law clerk to Judge Richard Austin, and later became one of the first magistrates under the Federal Magistrates Act. I've thought about both of them over the years as I worked with many, many women who have so much enhanced the profession. I've been very lucky to have worked for the EEOC. The work is fun. It's mostly litigation. And it's important. We do good things. It's also given me the opportunity to work with so many lawyers, women and men, who see the law as a way of doing good. So let me just thank, first of all, my husband and everyone else who's supported me so wonderfully on this day, one of the true peaks in my career. Thank you. Congratulations, Jean. Our next honoree, my friend and my law partner, Gordon Nash. Thank you to the Chicago Bar Association and the Chicago Bar Foundation. I have been privileged to serve both of these organizations, which do so much good in our community. To now have my name associated with Justice Stevens, a great American, is a distinct honor. I have been supported and mentored by many. When I came home from Vietnam, my brother Michael took me under his wing and pointed me in the right direction. I hope I have reciprocated by providing the same kind of counsel and advice to other young lawyers. I also want to thank my partners at Drinker, Biddle and Wreath and before the merger, Gardner, Carton and Douglas. They supported participation in the organized bar, community projects and pro bono cases. No one represents the values of that firm better than Debbie Sembach, who has been my legal assistant my entire career in private practice. Finally, I want to recognize my wife, Roseanne. We've been married for 46 years. She's supported me throughout my career. Being a trial lawyer is intense work. She provided balance marked by humor. We are fortunate to have four wonderful children and four great uh, grandchildren. Congratulations to the other honorees. You richly deserve the honor.
<laughs> Just for the record, the justice said I was a good caddy. We go way back. <laughs> And our final recipient is Kerry Peck. Good afternoon. My name is Kerry Peck. I'm humbled to receive the Stevens Award this afternoon. I want to congratulate all of the other recipients, distinguished members of our profession. I want to thank the Stevens Award Committee, my nominee tours, the CBA, and the CBF for selecting me to receive this honor. I also want to thank my nuclear family, my law firm family, both of whom have been extremely supportive during my legal career and my devotion to public service. I want to give a special shout out to two mentors, my father Joe Peck and Judge Abraham Lincoln Maravitz, both of them smiling down on us today, both of whom many in this room knew quite well. Finally. I want to encourage us to pass the Stevens torch to the younger members of our profession so that those attorneys also are instilled and know the importance of character traits such as integrity in the practice of law and devotion to community service. Thank you very much for joining us today and thank you once again for this extraordinary honor. Congratulations, Kerry. Again, congratulations to the eight richly deserving recipients of this most special CBA award. And at this time, before Judge Bauer takes over the podium and introduces Justice Stevens, I'd like to first wish Judge Bauer a happy 88 years young. Happy birthday to you. Judge Bauer's record of public service is extraordinary, and he, better than anyone, exemplifies the spirit of the Justice John Paul Stevens Award. Judge Bauer has served on the Seventh Circuit for more than 40 years, and we are privileged to call him a friend. Judge Bauer, if you can please come up and introduce Justice John Paul Stevens at this time, we would appreciate it. I have the most unnecessary job in the world <laughs> to introduce John Paul Stevens to this group. Now, I was selected for this job as a natural thing. He and I served together in the Court of Appeals, Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, for a year before he took higher pay. <laughs> and that's what he told me. He took the job because he wanted a raise. But I, I have one topping Justice Kilbride story about John Paul and their friendship. I was sworn in as a district court judge on the 29th of November, uh, 1971, succeeded by uh, on, as U.S. Attorney Jim Thompson, who's in the front row here. I got upstairs and found out that all the dogs and cats in the district court had, dumped, had been unloaded on me. I had 400 cases. Only 75% of them were patent cases and antitrust cases, <laughs> that sort of thing. And the first one, I arrived on Monday morning, there was a patent case involving one of the earlier CAT scans. And I diligently worked on it. It was a suit for an injunction because there's a limited amount of people that could use this machine. So on Wednesday afternoon, I completed work, entered an order with a temporary restraining order and Thursday morning, the case was reversed <laughs> by John Paul Stevens. Yeah. He and I had been friends for some time before then, but it gave me pause. <laughs> he was absolutely great in his ruling, but I have never been able to find a single judge that was reversed three days after he was sworn in. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I wish to thank him. He's kept me humble over all these years, too. One of the criteria, or the most important criteria for selection of those who receive this rather prestigious award, is that they are kind and civil to lawyers, to judges, to their fellow man, and to litigants. The recipients today all meet that standard. John Paul Stevens was the kindest man I ever served with. He was decent and civil to everybody. In his period on the Supreme Court, to those of you who are interested in listening, listen. He frequently opens any question by saying, may I ask you a question? This stands in marked contrast to some of the other discussions you hear from them. <laughs> that, for that fact alone, he should be received the accolades of the world at large. But he has been a model for judges, lawyers, and people. He's a war hero. Yeah, well, he didn't get killed or anything, yeah. <laughs> or even shot at. But he was responsible for Rodney. To those of you who don't know his background, he graduated from the University of Chicago in 1941, Northwestern University in 1947. He finished law school in two years. No one at the, as far as I can tell at the Northwestern University College of Law has matched his grade point average and his honors while he was at that institution. Earlier on, I take issue with something that Dan said when he entered. He reviewing, he said, recent justices of the Supreme Court. I think John Paul stands head and shoulders over 99% of those who ever served on that court. And I am pleased to call him my friend. He said before we got here, looking over the crowd, that had he known so many people were going to be here, he would have written a longer speech. <laughs> <laughs> I told him I'd take as much of the time as I wanted to. <laughs> so I want to introduce my friend, your friend, and one of the nicest people you will ever know or get to know, John Paul Stevens. Thank you very much. <coughs> this is always a, a moving occasion, but I don't know, today it's uh, special. Uh, so many friends here, Abner and Bill, as a matter of fact, they were both uh, down in my part of the world, what, what's now my, my part of the world, a couple of months ago to celebrate uh, my birthday, and I'm happy to be here to kind of participate in, uh, in Bill's celebration. And I really am, am uh, very much moved by uh, the whole event and the f fine choices you've made uh, to receive uh, the reward. I, it's, uh, very, it's very moving to, to, to participate in, in uh, uh, something like this. But I, I'm, I'm glad that uh, I followed my own advice some time ago and wrote out some remarks that I can read to you because I'm not sure I could handle a uh, uh, solo presentation the way Bill, Bill always, uh, always does. I'm sorry about that reversal, Bill, but every now and then, you know, you just have to do your job. <laughs> uh, returning to Chicago, to attend the luncheon in which fine lawyers are recognized for their outstanding contribution to the administration of justice is always an especially enjoyable occasion. I am happy to be able to extend my congratulations to each of the recipients who has been honored today. They're a fine group, I can, I can see that certainly. 
I plan to respond to your warm welcome by making a few remarks about my book, proposing six amendments to our Constitution. Specifically, I shall comment on the book review published in the Wall Street Journal in July that was authored by Stephen Calabrese, a well-respected member of the faculty of my favorite law school. Calabrese opposes all six of my proposals. <laughs> But he regards two of them, amending the Supremacy Clause in Article 6 to do away with the anti-commandeering rule that the court fashioned in the Prince case in 1997 and prohibiting po political gerrymandering as the most ill-considered of all six. Before co commenting on his objections to those two proposals, I shall briefly identify what he had to say of about three others. Get my speech first. He states that overturning the Second Amendment and doing away with the death penalty would cause, quote, public outrage, unquote. Those of you who have survived Illinois' decision to abolish the death penalty are better judges of the significance of the outrage that it generated than I am. But surely the fact that the losers in a debate may be outraged says nothing about the wisdom of a political decision. And with respect to the Second Amendment, it is important to remember that in the decades preceding the decision in Heller, the law unambiguously gave legislatures rather than federal judges the final authority in debates about the wisdom or lack thereof of laws regulating the sale or use of firearms. With respect to doing away with a, <coughs> a sovereign immunity doctrine that discriminates between state agencies and their private counterparts and which invalidated federal statutes enacted with bipartisan support imposing liability on states for the infringement of patents, copyrights, and trademarks, the book review merely states that my proposal, quote, would allow state governments to be sued for money damages for the first time in history, unquote. As cases like Chisholm against Georgia, decided in 1793, Osborne against the Bank of the United States, decided in 1824, and Pennsylvania against Union Gas, decided in 1989, demonstrate the statement is inaccurate. More importantly, however, it ignores the manifest injustices that the doctrine preserves and protects. Incidentally, I think th those who haven't seen the book, the, the, book, the chapter on sovereign immunity, I really is, I think, the most interesting of the book, <laughs> even though it may not s sound so fascinating to you. <laughs> Because it does really strike me as, as quite remarkable if you go through what started out as a, a common law doctrine and then became an 11th Amendment doctrine and then became a 10th Amendment doctrine and then eventually uh, today it's, it's something found in the, in the, uh, in, in the what, is it, what, is it, what is it, found an unwritten idea in the, in the plan of the convention. And it's interesting that the members of the present court know more about the unwritten part of the Constitution than the four out of five judges who decided the, the Chisholm case back in uh, 18, 18, whenever it was, shortly after <laughs> that. <laughs> but it was just at, at the beginning. And of those four, two of them had been, one of them had been a member of the Constitutional Convention, the other one was, was uh, uh, had, a, had been an author of the Federalist Papers, but anyway, the, the modern doctrine is bet, better. You know, you know, you know it when I see it. I guess. <laughs> While the book review mentions, without comment, my proposal to amend the Constitution to authorize reasonable limits on campaign political campaign expenditures, Professor Calabresi does does give reasons for disagreeing with my conclusions in my chapters on the anti-commandeering rule and political gerrymandering. With regard to the former, he correctly states that my proposal, quote, would allow Congress to force state officials to enforce federal law even when they are being paid for their time by state government, unquote. 
but then ignoring the lessons of history during the years prior to 1997 and the fact that federal laws are enacted by representatives of the states, he predicts, quote, it isn't hard to imagine what would follow. State officials would end up working for the federal government. They would lose their independence and the states would pay the resultant costs, unquote. But as a matter of fact, nothing of the kind occurred during either World War I or World War II when state officials administered the federal selective service laws. Indeed, the fact that the vast majority of law enforcement office officials supported the provision of the Brady Act that imposed a temporary requirement that they perform background checks on purchasers of firearms while the federal program was being developed belies Professor Calabresi's pessimistic prediction. Finally, while acknowledging that, quote, gerrymandering has poisoned our politics by causing incumbents in safe seats to worry about, to worry more about primary challenges than other, than about general elections, unquote, he objects to my proposed cure because it, quote, would strip yet another crucial power from the states, unquote. But the, quote, crucial power at issue is nothing more than the power to draw non-compact districts whose bizarre shapes were designed to preserve or enhance the political power of the party in control of the state government. He faults the book for its failure to answer th three hypothetical questions. Quote, should compact districts follow city and county boundary lines? Should they combine urban and suburban voters? Or should they just be drawn arbitrarily? Justice Stevens does not say. Perhaps that's because drawing, district, drawing district lines raises a non-judiciable political question, unquote. That is quite wrong, because each of the three questions asks for my preference between different examples of compact districts, and my proposed amendment merely prohibits non-compact districts the answer to each of the questions is that whatever the hypothetical legislature decides is perfectly okay with me. He also states that, quote, throughout U.S. history, state governments have always had the power to draw the boundary lines for U.S. congressional districts and state legislative districts, so long as the districts have roughly equal population and are geographically contiguous and compact, unquote. But even if states did have such power, just as states now have power to draw nothing but compact districts, during the years when Justice Frankfurter's rhetoric about political thickets held sway on the court, many state governments refused to redistrict to account for population changes. In 1946, to take an example from Illinois, in Colgrove Green, against Green, the court concluded that Illinois congressional districts with populations that varied from a little over 100,000 citizens to over, to over 900,000 citizens could not be challenged on misapportionment grounds because the issue raised a, quote, non-justiciable political question, unquote. Fortunately, the law has changed since then. There is a remarkable similarity between Justice Frankfurter's views about political thickets and Professor Calabresi's criticism of my book. My proposed constitutional amendment would make it perfectly clear that the court has the same power to, to prohibit political gerrymanders that it is already using to prohibit racial gerrymanders. Thank you for your attention and for your hospitality. Thank you, Justice Stevens, for those wonderful comments, for lending your hand to this wonderful day. Congratulations to the eight recipients who are honored in your honor, and we stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>